You're on the go, Tara. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, this evening's discussion. We're so proud to have all of our youth, and we're so proud to have all of our guests um, as well. We welcome everyone and appreciate your attendance. As Priscilla mentioned, it's late in the afternoon. You've had full days, but you chose to be here today, and we're so grateful. We're grateful to our guests to lending ear to our youth who have a, vo who have a voice um, in this setting today to ask questions and um, have discussions with all of you. And um, thank you for giving power to, the, to our young people's voices. And uh, again, we welcome all of you. Thank you so much, Tara. So before we begin, I'm going to tell you why we are here. So the Interfaith Children's Movement is an interfaith grassroots movement that advocates on behalf of children. And ICM is equally committed to make sure we empower the voices of youth. And to do that, we make sure that we have forms for them to do so. And this is why we have Youth Day at the Capitol. The intent here is to be a youth-led discussion. The youth will guide the discussion here today by asking questions of the legislators. So what I'm going to ask before we begin, there's a couple of formalities. If you're not speaking, please place yourself on mute. And when you ask a question, because I see when you have your pictures up, we can't see your name and your age. Could you, when you before you ask your question, state your first name and your age so they know that you, who you are. So from my screen, I'm gonna make sure I acknowledge um, legislators that are present um, from, Representative Oliver's office, she's not able to attend here today, but her chief of staff, Sydney Cleland, is here today. So can you wave your hand, Sydney? Thank you so much. And I see Senator Kim Jackson, raise your hand. Thank you so much. And then we have representative, let me just make this right, Jasmine Clark, right there. And then we have Senator Sheikh Rahman. Thank you so much. I see Houston Gaines, Representative Houston Gaines. His camera's not on, but he's here as well. So there's a couple of legislators. As soon as more come on, I will make sure that we acknowledge them. We're, we're waiting for a couple more students because I see there's not a quite filled as I thought it would be, but we're waiting for, I keep calling them students. We just graduated a cohort from the Social Academy, but we're waiting for a couple more youth for, to participate in Youth Day at the Capitol. But, um, so I am going to make sure that um, Tara and I will make sure that we monitor. Okay, got it. Tara and I will make sure that we will monitor the chat feature for questions or the hand raise for the hand raise as um, hand raise icons as well. So what I want to do is to make sure that everybody's comfortable, the camera's on, and make sure you acknowledge your first name and your age. So. Who would like to begin with the first question? I have a question. Okay, I have uh, Bethany. Make sure your cat, your mic is on, and for everybody else, turn off. So, Beck Bethany, go ahead and ask a question. Um, hello, my name is Bethany Taylor. Uh, I'm 13 years old. Um, yeah. I have a two-part question. Um, to explain first, um, in Chicago, there are, um, I can ask any question, right? Yes. In Chicago, there are, the um, children have EBT because in the parents' homes, certain families cannot contribute to getting food in the house. So I was wondering, could Georgia possibly have children have, from ages 10 to 18 have EBT to help contribute with the food in the house? Thank you. And any legislator is free to answer that question. Um, all we ask is um, the response to the extent possible, limited to two, me two minutes, so I can make sure all the youth have the ability to ask questions. So if you're willing to, to, to tackle that question, I um, you're more than willing, you're more than happy to do so. All right, I guess I can uh, jump in and um, thank you, Bethany, for your question. Um, it's very thoughtful um, that you're thinking about uh, food security in the home. 
Um, so here in Georgia, the way that we uh, provide those services is actually through uh, the application by the parent, um, but it is based on our, our, um, some of the factors of uh, who is eligible and how much you're eligible for is based on the um, individuals that do live in the home. So if there is a food uh, insecurity in the home, um, you um, the adult should be able to apply for the EBT card and the amount that goes onto that card should reflect uh, the needs of the people that live within the home. Right now, we do not have a mechanism where children themselves can apply um, for an EBT card uh, at the at the moment that I know of. Um, I think uh, it, it is uh, largely done through the adult uh, in the home. Okay. Um... I, I do know that um, the adults in the family have an EBT card, but like, I have two moms and one of them has an EBT card and one of them don't. So I get the perspective of them both, one of them having an EBT card and one of them don't. And sometimes it's not enough. And so if everyone had an EBT card, then it would be enough and everyone can get what they need. Like I take lunches from school because I have allergies. And so sometimes I, I, have, I have to get wheat and different type of breads and meats. And so, um, I have to have certain types of things and they're more expensive than others. So it will be more convenient if everyone had one, even if they're not eligible because my second mom, she has just a smidge more money than it makes than my other mom. So she just doesn't account for it. Yeah, so this is Senator Kim Jackson. Um, thank you for that follow up, Bethany. Um, I think you raised this greater question around how much money we are providing on EBT cards. And there was a time during the pandemic where that amount was raised for a little bit to try to help families meet, uh, make ends meet. And so I think that's work that we need to continue to do and some work that we can continue to push for is to raise the amount um, that's available on any individual's EBT card um, and to also review the salary requirement. So what I'm hearing you say is that one of your moms makes just a little bit too much money, pushes her over to make her ineligible. Um, and so I think we need to, given the amount of inflation that we're having, you know, a loaf of bread costs a whole lot more today than it did uh, a year ago. So I, I think that it's actually incumbent upon us as legislators to also review the salary um, limits as we consider what, um, how, how students are able to, or how parents are able to um, get money for EBT. But um, thank you. I didn't actually know about this um, card that was being uh, handed out in Chicago for students. And so um, thanks for bringing that to our attention and I, I look forward to actually learning more about it. Thank you so much for that response, that question and responses. So do I have anyone else who has a question? I'm looking at the chat feature, raise your hand or um, to, to raise the hand function is actually in the reactions button. If you go there, you'll see the raise the hand. So the next person I noticed was Zachary. Then we're gonna go to asthma. Zachary, go ahead with your question. Uh, Zachary Langevin, 13 years old from Georgia. I'm just uh, kind of worried. This is my main question. The main reason I came here actually is because I know someone named Copper and she told me about quite a frightening tale that happened at her school where several children were sexually assaulted right there in the parking lot. At least I think the details might have gotten muddled. So what I'm asking you is this, what are you going to do about child raping and making sure they're not subject to sexual violence? Well, uh, first, uh, Zachary, that is, sounds like a very scary story. So um, th that is definitely something that uh, would concern me greatly. Um, I know um, for myself, I have introduced uh, legislation that would help uh, students really understand, um, you know, things like consent so that they can understand when assaults are happening um, or they can um, advocate for themselves. Um, also in um, Georgia, we have a requirement that students learn about sexual abuse as well. Um, and it also sounds like there might be some issues uh, with security, um, but that would be more of a local issue um, where your local school boards and um, the, the uh, administration of 
your school should look into security um, just to make sure that everyone goes to school and that they feel safe when they are going to school. All right, thank you very much. It, it's, it just makes me so happy to know that someone is actually making sure that this stuff doesn't happen again. Any more responses? Well, one thing when you hear something like that is really serious concern for all adults. We want to make sure our children are safe. Doesn't matter if you're at home or school, on the street, on the bus, whatever it, it is. So anytime you see someone, make sure you notify, talk to your parents or your teachers or your elderly, whoever you feel comfortable. Anytime you see something or if you need anything, anytime you're suspicious of anything, make sure you notify some adult. And not only as a legislator, we're gonna do anything and everything in, within our power to protect our children in Georgia or anywhere, anywhere, as a matter of fact. So I really breaks my heart to even hear this kind of question, but the, the reality is things are happening all over. We need to know, you need to tell us if we can do anything better for you all, whatever is comfortable. And I tell you one thing, this is a great, the meeting in Zoom, but I tell you sometimes when the COVID is over, I invite each of you all anywhere, if you are in, in Georgia, please come and visit us. This will gonna be, you'll have a much greater experience how we work, what's happening. And I just want you to all know that your voice count. Doesn't matter how old you are, whatever you say, that means a lot to us. So I invite each and all of you come and visit us, us too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So the next on my list, because I'm keeping track, is asthma. Um, OK, let me just um, raise my hand really quick. Um, can, um, so um, I know that, like, um, for Christians, they have um, they have like holidays for Christmas and stuff. While um, for us, we don't really celebrate Christmas, but we celebrate a different um, holiday um, called Eid. Um, can we have that as a celebration, like a break on Eid? As a matter of fact, currently I'm working in a legislator. I'm working for on a legislation right now to in, in terms of eat twice a year, we can have a holiday in a statewide in school and uh, and also the work in the government. Bill is not submitted, but it's in the process right now. I personally working as, as we speak. And, and I'll just follow up and say, uh, you should still be able to receive an yeah. excused yeah. absence yeah. even today. And if you're not getting an yeah. excused absence um, for Eid, and if you're not receiving accommodations um, during Ramadan, um, and then please, um, we want to know that because those are things that you're entitled to um, as a person who lives here in Georgia. That's correct. That's correct. Right now, if you eat, you know, you can be excused. That's the law. Thank you. Um, um, I also like at school though, I don't really want to miss any school and like miss anything important. So that's why I want to make it a holiday. That 100% makes perfect sense. And so um, I look forward to working with Senator Rachman on trying to make that happen for us. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next on our list, I'm making sure I'm getting everybody is Zev. Zev? Okay, hello. Um, good afternoon, my name is Zev and I'm 13 years old. Um, so given that teen suicide and teen depression is has dramatically been increasing as a result of stress that kids encounter through the pandemic, um, is Georgia going to prioritize finding, um, I mean, funding towards kids' mental health programs? Um, so I'll start um, because I do, um, I think that um, mental health is pretty much on the priority list for um, the state legislature this year. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, uh, that we may make good on our promises 
to invest in mental health services across the board, but um, especially for our students. I also um, would like to mention that I have legislation that I would like to introduce that was actually brought to me by students um, that would allow for students to have access to a mental health screening. Very similar to how you know how you go to the doctor before school starts and you get your ears checked to know if you, you know, need help with hearing or you get your eyes checked to know if you need glasses. Um, this would just be another type of screening. It's not a diagnosis, but it would at least help you all to, um, you know, know if you are in need of resources and then to make sure that those resources are available to those who need them. Um, and so I think these are the types of policies um, that we need here in our state. And like I said, these are the types of policies that have been brought to me by students. Um, you know, uh, we have had, unfortunately, in the House, a lot of, um, of tragic news when it comes to um, mental health crises and suicide, um, even amongst our colleagues. And so this is something that I think everyone is really, really focused on. And, um, you know, uh, you, you should see movement in the state legislature on this very subject. If nothing else moves, I think this year is going to be the year where we actually see some progress on mental health. Okay, thank you. Great. So, um, Tadish, you're next. Um, hello. My name is Tadessa and I'm 12 years old. Um, my question is, do you think kids as young as 15 should be allowed to vote and why? I, I love that question. Um, I I wish that more kids who were 18 would vote, um, first of all. And that would be a really, really great start if all the 18 year olds would vote. Um, I actually, I think that there could be some issues where children who are younger um, would be able to have some input. So I think about um, particularly some things that have to do with your schooling education, things that have direct impact on younger people. Um, I would, I, Maybe it's a non-binding referendum, but I would certainly um, be interested in hearing the opinions more clearly from young people. And I think it's a great idea to get kids practice in the practice and in the habit of voting at a young age. So I, I would support something that would allow for us to hear from children through a voting um, practice in a way that would help uh, guide our decision making. Thank you. Great, thank you for the question and response. Stephen, you have a question. Yes, okay, it's kind of similar to Zachary's question is like, how are you working on to make school more safe as of keeping dangerous items out of school? Because at my middle school, we used to have metal detectors and they would check our bags or items, but here at my high school, they don't. They just let us walk right in. And, that, and sometimes when I'm in the bathroom, I've noticed that kids are managing to smuggle in vape pens. And there was an incident at my school where someone brought weed. And if, that, if kids are somehow managing to bring in that, I'm kind of worried what else they're going to bring. So I, it's open to anybody to answer. I know these are like really, really tough questions. These are what our children are facing today. So if, if you guys are, are free to answer at your at your own pace. Well, I'll, uh, I, I didn't want to, uh, you know, completely just take over and answer all the questions, but I, I do um, worry about these same things because I have a daughter who is in middle school. And every time she goes into that school building, um, you know, I um, have to, you know, I, I hope and I pray that I, uh, she comes home to me in the same condition that she left me, um, except for maybe she knows a little bit more um, than she did when she left home. Um, so, you know, these types of issues are very important to me as a mom, but also as a legislator, because, you know, we can implement policies to try to help with these types of things. Um, 
A lot of these things, however, are really going to have to be um, uh, the focus of your local government. So, you know, when it comes to schools and the way that schools are run, a lot of that is done by your school's administration. And, you know, if you really have concerns, you should take them to your uh, local school board. They really have the power um, to, to do more in those instances. And also um, they are, that's, that's really, you know, that's their wheelhouse. Um, and, and so I would say if you have these concerns, make sure that your school board is aware of them. You can do that by, you know, emailing them or you could go and speak at a school board meeting. Um, but your, your concerns are very valid. You know, the first time I got a phone call from my daughter saying that someone was vaping in the uh, gym locker room, it really did concern me. I appreciated that my daughter felt like she could come to me and talk to me about these issues. And what I can say is that we have been uh, working on making sure that we keep access to those things as far away from schools as possible. However, um, outside of legislation that kind of really tries to keep things like stores that are, are you know, vape shops and things away from school, uh, school zones, um, you know, a lot of that's going to have to really come down to how the, the school is being run by the school's administration and by the school board. Thank you. Before we get to the next question, I want to... Uh... Oh, yes. Thank. I would like to acknowledge uh, Senator Brian Strickland. Raise your hand so the students can see you. Thank you hey. so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you all so much for having me. Thank you for being here. So our next question is going to come from Zachariah. Good afternoon, my name is Zakaria and I'm nine years old. So my question is to say Raymond is, what are you doing to reduce homophobia? What I'm doing personally, you know, this is something that not only me, all of us, not uh, as, a, as a legislator, as an adult, as a country, as a whole, we have to work toward make sure that that doesn't have any place in our society. We got to have a message, right? Maybe we are not messaging right or we're not coming out and, you know, saying against, uh, you know, all these hates and homophobia, whatever you name it. We, we have so much stuff going on right now, you know, discourse around the country, all over. So we need to make sure our children are safe. We need to make sure as an adult, we teach our children how to behave, how to talk. We have to do a better job as an adult, not only myself, all of us, we gotta do a better job in terms of, you know, make sure there's, there's a harmony, there's a, what you call, you know, I don't, I, I, I just, you know, I, I wrestle myself with, all the time, the same questions, what I can do myself, being a better person, how if I see something not right, how you can communicate. So this is necessarily that one of us, you know, can change, but all of us combined, we have a responsibility to the next generation of children, next generation of American, next generation of people, you know. So it breaks my heart even to hear this kind of questions to, I, I, I don't know sometimes how to answer this question, be honestly, but uh, as, as a person, I think we all need to do a better job. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I Can add I, I'll, that? No, go ahead, Kim. I've been uh, talking a lot, you go ahead. <laughs> no problem. I'll, I'll just add um, that I think that the bills that uh, Senator Rachman and others are working on to try to raise awareness around the need to have Eid as a holiday, um, as a part of how we address Islamophobia. It's by highlighting and naming that there are Muslims who live in our great state. Um, and I think that having Senator Rachman, um, who's on the floor and out and tells people um, and is thinking very critically about um, issues that affect, impact the Muslim community, the immigrant community, 
is a part of how we do this work too, right? It's, it's so, so important that we have people of different faiths who work down there in the Capitol. And uh, Senator Rahman is one of those persons who is, um, who brings that diversity and who really, really fights, I think, to make sure we never forget that um, everybody in our state is not just of one faith or one color or even one country of origin. Thank you so much for that question and responses. The next person is Zara. Hi, I'm Zara and I'm 15. And so as we know, like schools are being fully funded next year. Um, so that means we're getting a lot more money towards like counselors and buses. And so that's gonna mean like more time for kids, right? So the mental health like will be helped, but what about when we like um, finish using all that money? So like I'm asking, what are we doing to make sure uh, even after all of the money has been used, we still can give the same funding to the schools so we can still pay for counselors and um, have like have the students have having someone to talk to. Thank you so much for your question. I think it's so crucial. So you're right, we are living in a time where we have a whole lot of money and um, thankfully we're able to spend that money on some really important things. And so I, I appreciate you though, thinking about the future and um, how we will use money in the future if we have a little bit less. And um, here's my thing. We will, those of us I think who are on this call and I, and I say that for, I think I can speak clearly for uh, every representative who's on this call, um, we will always fight for children and for children's education. And we will always fight uh, to make sure that it gets the funding that is needed. That is a commitment that, um, that for those of us who are on this call, um, I'm, I'm looking, I see Brian and Jasmine and, and Jake Rahman, we will fight to try to make sure that um, our schools continue to be fully funded, even in the more lean years. Um, and please be patient and understand that these are hard decisions for us to make when there's less money, um, because there are a lot of different needs out there, right? Um, so if we give more money to counseling, then maybe we give less money to healthcare. Um, you know, like there's just a lot of balances that we're trying to make. And this is a really great year. We've got all this extra stuff. So it's a lot easier. But in the leaner years, it's harder. Um, but know that each one of us uh, that's on this call that we will always, always fight for you all for your education to make sure it's well funded. And I'll just add really quickly to that, um, just so you understand, um, a lot when when cuts happen, um, I can say uh, definitively that I hate it every time we have to make a single dollar cut from education, because I think that funding education and fully funding um, education um, actually um, uh, is the starting point to so many other things that we care about. So when we talk about mental health and we talk about safety and we talk about, you know, um, you know, inclusion and things like that, these are, that all stems from us doing the basics of making sure that our schools are fully funded. But uh, the difference between the federal government and our state government is that the federal government, um, they can, they can borrow and a deficit. So that means they can borrow more than they have in the bank. Here in the state, we're, we are not allowed to operate like that. So we have a set amount of money that we can spend. And so when you have a set amount of money and you have a set amount of programs, you have to decide where that money goes, but there is no, um, there's no option to go into debt. So that, uh, that really um, is the reason why um, we have to sometimes make the unfortunate decision to make cuts. And usually those cuts aren't just to education, they're across the board. But one of the things about it is Georgia spends a, a huge chunk of their budget. So you think about budget, meaning all the things you spend money on, a huge chunk of that is on education. So that means that if we have to make a cut, even if it's a small percentage of a cut, it's going to feel really big to education just because of the numbers. 
it's going to be a lot more for education than it would be for other um, departments that are also depending on the budget. Um, but as uh, Senator uh, Tim Jackson said, um, we all are committed to uh, do investing in our students because that's so important. That's an investment in our future and an investment into so many other things in our state. And so um, making cuts is always a very difficult decision and hopefully um, it's one that we don't have to make for a while. Any more responses? Thank you. So now the next person on the list is Tadise. Um, so my, my question is, um, what is the youngest age of a child that you would send to an adult jail or prison for an adult crime and why? I will not send a child to an adult prison for any reason under any circumstance. A child is a child and a child belongs in a place that is designed for children. Full stop, there is no age. Thank you. Then um, what's the threshold? Like at what age is a child considered not a child? Right now in Georgia, the lately, uh, well, it depends on the, depends on the crime. Um, but what we're trying to do in, in Sydney, Cleveland, um, the chief of staff for Mary Margaret Oliver, I think could speak to this really well, but um, legally you are an adult at age 18. Um, but there are obviously some ex exceptions around how we treat people um, when it comes to crimes. But Sydney, I'd love for you to chime in because I know this is your, um, Mary Margaret Oliver's area of expertise. Well, uh, it is. And I just want you to know that this is something it's kind of a great example of how long it takes to get things done. Uh, Representative Oliver has worked on this issue for a very long time, many years, to try to um, raise the age at which a child, uh, and in this case, we're talking an older teenager, can be accused of a crime and tried as an adult. You know, if you're accused of a crime, you go to trial. And so, uh, the question is, will you be tried in a juvenile court or will you be tried in a, an adult court as an adult? And as Senator Jackson told you, there are some crimes that are so terrible, they're considered, they're called felonies. You may have heard this. And they, um, no matter the, a, the age of the person, um, doesn't always determine where they're tried. Uh, some, some juveniles are tried as adults for those crimes. But the biggest issue is that we are continuing to put um, children, as Kim uh, Jackson says, uh, into adult prison populations, which is not a good idea, and also to try them as adults. So one of the uh, things that Representative Oliver is working on, I, I believe Georgia is now one of only three states in the entire country that uh, considers us 16 year olds to be uh, or 17 year olds to be adults. And so the, the legislation that she's put forward in the past is to um, have the right, have the age of at which a juvenile is considered an adult raised so that ju juveniles who are 17 will still be treated as juveniles for purposes of, of their uh, trials. So I hope that's clear. That legislation will come back up again this year, I believe. Um, she is working on it. Uh, but again, Georgia is one of the last states to, to do this. And it's important for you to know that a lot of what's happened around this issue has to do with research about um, when does a person stop being a kid and become an adult. And so there's a lot of research about brain development uh, and about what kids do that, um, you know, is impulsive um, and that is, but yet might land them in um, accused of a crime. So this is a huge issue and that's a great question. I think it was Tadisi who asked that question. Um, super question and thank you. Um, just know that there is uh, uh, there are people, especially in the house, working on this. Mm -hmm. Any additional responses? Hey, I'll jump in. I'm sorry, my technology. I lost my computer. Now I'm on my phone. Hope y'all can hear me okay. Um, 
the, the raise the age bill is actually in the Senate Judiciary Committee right now that I chair. Last year, the bill passed out of our committee and it did not make it for final passage. One of the challenges, going back to the last question on the budget too, um, you have a lot of us like me that supported the bill, but there were people that were worried that Georgia didn't have enough funding for our juvenile jails, you know, detention centers where juveniles are sent versus adults to handle additional people. And that's one of the things that we are working on to make sure that we are set up so we can pass this law and actually make it work and have facilities there available. And so I appreciate the work that our colleagues, in particular in the House, that already passed this bill did. And so this is one of those things where you have a lot of us that want to see it pass, but we're having to work with our colleagues on the money side to make sure that we do have everything properly funded to make sure we can actually make it work as a law. Thank you so much for that question and the responses. So the next on the list is Alicia. Hi, my name is Alicia and I'm 16. And my question is um, taking into consideration recent changes with House Bill 872, how do you plan to tackle redistricting with the county maps that are being proposed currently? Well, I will jump in on that one since that is Gwinnett County, um, and that is the county um, where I uh, serve as the vice chair of the delegation. Um, so uh, House Bill 872 is our uh, maps for our Board of Education, um, and alongside that, we also had House Bill 873. Unfortunately, what we saw recently is that um, uh, our local bill, it's a, it, maps are considered local bills because it's about a specific area of the state, um, was uh, taken out of the local bill process and then put into a, a, another process for more general bills. So general bills are general are bills that would affect the entire state and, you know, are, um, are, are more, you know, general in nature. Um, so, our concerns right now are that we don't know what's going to happen to the bills. Um, we have, uh, we did not, um, uh, we did not initiate the bills being taken out of the local process. So whoever did initiate that has not given us any clues as to why or what they plan to do. Um, and so we're waiting and we're having conversations to try to figure out what's going on. Um, but in the meantime, we are hoping that um, cooler heads will prevail and that we will be able to pass the maps that the people actually chose. So we had a very open process where we had surveys and we actually surveyed the people and asked them what they wanted. And the maps that we got were the maps that the people chose overwhelmingly. Um, and so uh, we hope that um, the people's maps are the maps that will ultimately pass. Um, out of the legislature, but right now it's kind of a wait and see. Um, so I am impressed that you are keeping up with those uh, things. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for keeping up with what's going on here in Gwinnett County. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's 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 all a process and we're taking it day by day um, and um, we're hoping for the best scenario possible, which is fair maps passed by the people. Great. So next um, we have Oishi. Hi, my name is Oishi. I'm 17. And I just had a question um, regarding education and fully funded schools. So um, I saw House Bill 888 and I just had a few questions um, because of how um, I believe that, you know, Georgians deserve honest um, and quality education. And I feel like House, what House Bill 888 would do um, is kind of strip that from students. And I think um, that it would also kind of, it also states that um, they're allowed to take funding away from schools if they do teach it. Um, so how I feel like that'd be a little bit contradictory to, um, you know, the promise of fully funded schools. And I also believe that it wouldn't be preparing students like me for our future in, you know, other states, wherever we decide to go for school um, or our future in general. So 
um, my question is, what are you all doing to fight for um, students, uh, honest and um, quality, fully funded education? I'll, I'll just say I agree with everything that you've just named, um, that we uh, need our schools to be fully funded and that we should not be punishing students, children. Ultimately, that's what would happen if we defund it, if we, if we find uh, school districts for uh, teaching something that breaks this weird rule, um, we would be hurting children. And I think that's a real problem. And so um, certainly I will, um, I will fight against it. And I agree with you that we need to teach our children, you all deserve to learn the truth. You deserve to know a history um, and to, to understand that this country hasn't always been um, the country that it is today and, and maybe is not even the country that we had hoped that it would be today either. Um, I think that's uh, fundamental. You all deserve that. Um, you need to know that. And uh, we need to be telling that truth. And uh, the, the last thing that I'll add to that is some of this is uh, we just have to educate our colleagues around um, what it really means, I think, to, to teach an honest and fair history, and that that can be done without um, without diminishing any one person or any any particular race. That we can talk about a history of enslavement in this country and in, and talk about that in a way that doesn't mean, therefore, if you're white, you're bad. Um, we can do that. We can we can do both things, right? Uh, we can do two things at once: tell the truth about slavery and um, love people who are um, people who are not necessarily the same color that I am, right? And so that's, I think, some of the work that has to be done is to simply continue to do that education and talk about the ways that we can tell a truthful story about where we are um, as a nation, about where we've come from as a nation, without in any way diminishing the value of any single human being who is, who is with us here. So. Any more responses? Thank you. The next person is Zachary. Yes, so my dad is a professor at the Georgia Tech, um, at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and uh, it was founded in 1885. And let's see here, what was the tuition for Georgia Tech in 1885? It was free for Georgia residents and $150 for out-of-state students, equivalent to 4320 now let's just look up the Georgia Tech for tuition for 2022. Oh boy, it's 13,024 for Georgia residents and 34,135 for out of state students. That's quite a big leap. So what I am asking right now is, um, are you planning on making higher education cheaper for, um, uh, for people to get better jobs? I, I can jump in. Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So I will say one thing that's important: um, tuition is set by the Board of Regents, but um, legislators work on policies, um, and obviously, we also fund the budget for Board of Regents as well. And so, it's not something we get a pass on. And I think it's it's definitely something that a lot of us, I think, everybody on this call, has been pushing for years to get. The Board of Regents to stop raising tuition, which they've done in recent years, but what they start doing is raising fees. And one of the things in this year's budget that we're doing, um, and the proposed budget so far the governor set forth, is going to fully fund or put more money into our, our colleges to where those fees will be taken care of. And so that's one of the things with the extra revenue Georgia has that we decided to do. In the long run, of course, it's important we continue to fully fund the HOPE Scholarship, and um, the other big policy thing that a lot of us have pushed for in a bill that I'm going to be filing tomorrow goes with this as well, is looking for other opportunities for students or adults that go back to school as well to not just have to go to the traditional um, liberal, art, liberal arts schools um, or, or schools such as Georgia Tech, have other options such as technical schools and have the high demand training there for the jobs that are here now so someone doesn't have to go and take on all the debt that's associated with higher ed and can start out making more money than, than I did my first year out of law school. Um, the bill that I'm gonna be filing tomorrow that uh, I think my colleagues on this call may have already signed on to as well, is gonna set up an apprenticeship program in our state where we're gonna fund apprenticeship programs through employers. So people 
um, now versus going to a traditional school through our technical school system can get an apprenticeship degree in essence and go ahead and get on the job training to, to actually get jobs today. So it's a great, great question. It's something that um, has been talked about for some time at the Capitol as we look at the tuition going up. And it was so smart of you um, to, you're probably gonna go to Georgia Tech one day because you not only knew the tuition cost, but how to adjust that to today's dollars. Cause that shows that we're still way, way out of touch and way out of hand with how much tuition has gone up. Good. But thank you. Oh, well, well, that too. Google can save you too. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> you know, I, I must say something because uh, my daughter goes to Georgia Tech. So that's what I'm, uh, I, I want to make a comment. I'm not that smart, but anyway, I went to a different school. But when I went to school myself, whatever I paid for my entire uh, four years college, you know, it took me a number of number more years. But anyway, I spent uh, my daughter, for my daughter, probably half a year, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> I know what you're talking about. It is very expensive. As my colleagues say, we do not set up the tuition. Uh, it's hard. We are, I, I believe each of us, everybody at the legislature, nobody wants tuition to go higher up. Doesn't matter where you're from. Everybody wants to have a lower tuition fees. Everybody, all of us, we want to make sure we provide good, uh, uh, education to our uh, next generation uh, of Georgian. So we'll be working, all of us will be working, try to see what we can do, try to keep the cost down. All right, thank you. Just, it's really annoying to see the whole, oh, if you work hard and go to school, you can get yourself a good job when some people can't actually go to school. And um, I actually have another question, but I'm gonna let somebody else ask and then uh, I'll circle right back around. Thank you so much, Zachary. So the next person is Stephen. Okay, I just have a question about how are you going to get more kids involved with some of the decisions of some of these issues? Because I, some of these issues are probably best if kids decide decide for themselves. Stephen, can you give an example of some of the issues that you'd like to have kids weigh in on? Well, I guess maybe like, I don't know. Well, um, Stephen, I will say this, um, I, um, I really value the input from students about anything that they feel um, affects their life, you know, so if, you know, you might not be able to think of anything right now, um, but if there is something um, that, you know, is really concerning you and you want to reach out to your legislator, um, I think that it's, in, it's important that people know how to do that so that they are able to uh, do exactly that. Also, you have forums like this one where you get an opportunity to actually engage and ask your questions directly to legislators. I'll be honest, I'm a little envious because when I was 12 and 13, um, I had never, ever, ever met a politician. I don't even know if I'd even been in the same room with a politician, and I never had this much access. And so I think it's amazing what's being done here. And I uh, hope that students across the state and across the country get these types of opportunities to engage with their legislators and ask these very important and honestly very hard questions. Um, um, you guys are not um, holding back on us. And I, I really do appreciate that from you all. Um, I will say for, uh, for me, a lot of the bills that I introduced have actually come from high school students who have engaged me. Um, there are organizations uh, you know, uh, at the high school level. I'm not sure if there are any at the middle school level, but I know at the high school level, there are organizations that are clubs that are formed and they reach out to legislators and do things similar to what we're doing today. And so I would just say you as, um, as a youth can reach out to your peers and say, hey y'all, there are opportunities to talk to our legislators. Let's use those opportunities and let's ask our questions because they'll actually answer them. Um, so there you go. Thank you.
We are going to Bethany next. Hi. Okay. Uh, so, um, my question was, what are you going to be doing about um? Oh, I just have a light there. Um. What are you going to be doing about the, um, oh yes. In school, as you know, we get lunches and breakfasts and they're much healthier than they was a few years ago. But these lunches are, students are choosing, students are choosing not to eat them and not eating them, which is not healthy for them, but they're not eating them because of what it is. Like in my school, you get these little packets. It's one pop tart, a juice, and some animal crackers, and that's all you have for four hours. And then you get a, a um, some pasta, like um, a burger, a vegan burger, and broccoli in each for the rest of the day, and a cup of milk. And that's all you have for the whole day. So I was asking, is can we get like better lunch foods and breakfast foods and more nutritional? I just want to say I love this question because I was asking that same question when I was your age. <laughs> this seems like a like just an unsolvable. It seems it should be not this difficult. Um, I don't know who's in charge of school lunches. Maybe somebody on here smarter than I do. Who do we call? Brian, uh, Jasmine. Who who do we call about their school lunches being terrible? Well, that's usually going to be the school system. Um, I think. Um, because, and the reason why I say that is because I don't think lunches across the state are exactly the same. Um, I think, you know, if you um, have lunch in DeKalb County, it might not necessarily be the same lunches that people are having in Gwinnett. Because I know here in Gwinnett, for example, we have options for things like halal meats and um, things like that for students. And I don't know that every district in the, in the state has that. Um, so uh, I would say, uh, um, that's going to be a school system level issue. Maybe start with the school board and go from there. Um, and uh, you know, let them know uh, that you are you are not happy with what is there because you're right. Um, this is your nutrition. Eating is important, and y'all are at the y'all in the prime of your lives. You're growing, and you should be thriving. And a part of that is eating a very good diet. So um, this is actually it seems kind of silly, and yes, it is the same question that we've all asked our whole lives. And I'm I'm almost forty, um, but yes, it is. Uh, um, it's important that the meals that students are eating, because um, for some people that's that is their meal for the day. That we're giving them good quality food. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next person we have on the list is Omar. Hey, so my name is Omar. I'm 15. Um, so when I fill out forms, any kind of forms really, I'm asked to check a box for my race. But I never see a representative box for, for my race, right? Uh, I'm Arab, though no Arab or Southwest Asian or North African box is, at, um, is present. And I end up having to sign off, sign off as white. So why is that? I mean, Omar, you're welcome to sign off as black if you would like. <laughs> you have other choices. Um, we'll we'll receive you. Um, that's my my sarcastic, but tr truly, like we invite you to that. Um, but I think it's a question of representation. That's what you're bringing up, and um, this is some of the work that we just have to continue to do for so long here in Georgia. We've only thought in terms of white and black, and sometimes maybe Hispanic. And um, as our populations continue to grow and to diverse di diversify, so do our forms. Um, they need to grow and diversify too. And so um, I, I thank you for raising that issue. Um, and I think that there, I know that there are people on this call, myself included, who are interested in making sure that we um, truly actually, we don't always know what the true diversity is of any county or any given place because our forms aren't good. Um, and so these are things that we do need to change. And I really, really appreciate you for naming that as a problem, for seeing that as a problem. And I do invite you, if you would like to join the African-American caucus, you can join it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much for the question and response. The next person we have is Morgan. Um, so uh, if this kind of goes like, like from, cause I've been in several counties before and I was just wondering, um, so in my elementary school, it was a theme school um, in DeKalb, but um, we were forced, like not forced, but it was like part of our, uh, like our, exploratory time um, um, and were there courses that we had to take up Spanish classes. Um, but like when we go to other schools, like Spanish, like, or like other languages are like, they're not necessarily like mandatory, they're like more optional. And in my school right now, um, we only are allowed to take two, like two courses. And um, like basic, and like, you don't really have to take language classes until you get to like high school. So my question is, um, like, um, like should, like, could students take language classes like earlier? Like, because it might be easier for them to take language classes when they're younger than when they're older because it might be harder. Like, because people, like, around, like, people in other parts of the world are like learn two languages while like in our like school we don't really learn other languages. So I love this question. And one of the reasons why I love this question is because as I travel, exactly what you said is uh, what's true. I, I will never forget, I went to Japan and there was a group of students and they, are, um, they were on a field trip and they were walking up to tourists because they were in a tourist area. And so that means they were walking up to people from all over the world and um, they were asking, they were communicating with them in whatever language that uh, those people spoke. So first, the first question they asked is, what country are you from? And then the next question, uh, and once they found out what country they were from, they would then start having a conversation with them in that language. And I was so impressed at this. And I was a little jealous. Um, I have spent a lot of time, a lot of time trying my best to uh, learn Spanish and it's been very difficult for me in my older age. And so I would love to see um, us encouraging uh, learning more foreign languages earlier and encouraging all of our students like they do across the world to be multilingual, bilingual, or even multilingual by the time they graduate from high school. Um, this really boils down to curriculum. And a lot of times curriculum boils down to funding and you know things like that. So all it's a big one big circle when it comes to these things. Um, but if this is something that you really feel passionate about, again, this is something that can be brought up to your school board. Um, they have curriculum committees that meet. And so these are these are the types of issues where you can say, as a student, I would like to have access to more uh, uh, language, um, uh, uh, foreign language options in schools and uh, go from there. So you could do statewide policy as well, um, but it's uh, a lot of these issues are actually a lot easier to get done at the local level. Outstanding, thank you. So our next person on the list is Tadise. Uh, uh, my question is, do you, do you um, think that poor people without health care should pay like, a small amount or not have to pay at all for health care? So uh, I, 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 you were kind of breaking up, but your question is, can people sp f pay a smaller amount for health care? Yes. OK. So um, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so I, I'm going to speak as Kim Jackson, age 37, from, you know, on Ruby Road in Stone Mountain, Georgia, just as Kim. Um, and as also, I am a pastor and a person who really does try to follow the teachings of Jesus. I fundamentally believe that all human beings should have access to health care, regardless of their ability to pay. That's 
what I believe. I believe that in my heart. Now, how our government and gets to that place, um, how we're able to fund that and pay for that, I don't really know, but I do 100% believe, you know, I follow the teachings of a man who walked around, um, you know, hundreds of years ago, and he gave out free health care to everybody. Like, if you walked up and you're like, hey, I'm lame, I can't walk, Jesus was like, all right, cool, I got you. And he didn't ask for any money. He didn't ask for any papers. He didn't ask for citizenship, right? Um, so those are the teachings that impact my life that I try to live by. And so that's what I would hope for for all citizens. Again, I can't answer how we get there. I just know that that's what I would hope for. And I can add one thing to that. Um, I think most of us share the, the same belief that everybody needs access to health care. Um, one of the challenges in Georgia that we have that's not not just unique to Georgia, but especially in, in our more rural parts of our state, is even if you have access to health care coverage in some way, you still may not have a doctor that you can get to that's close by. And, and you may not have a special kind of doctor for whatever you need that you're sick with to get to you if you have a general doctor to go to. And so it's also as we look for ways to, to fund more access to care, we have to also look at not just getting people coverage, but making sure we have incentives for doctors and specialists to go in certain parts of our state and work. And that's one of the things that both sides at the, at the state capitals worked on in the budget this year, we're adding more um, residency programs to try to, in our medical schools to try to send people to more rural parts of our state and have more doctors in our state. And so I'd agree with my colleague, um, it's something we strive for, but it has many, many levels we have to look at on that. Thank you so much. The next person is Oishi. It's Oishi. Um, Oishi. Oishi. Um, yeah, I just had a question um, regarding mental health. Like Representative Clark was saying, you currently are working on a bill for mental health screening. I was wondering if there's going to be any legislation or if you guys would be um, willing to support any any legislation um, surrounding like school counselors and school counseling, because I know that's a really big issue me and my peers have been facing is getting access to school counselors, um, not having enough school counselors and you know, just not having mean of meaningful experiences with our school counselors. So I do think that's gonna be a budget issue. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, it, it goes down to funding. Um, we send the funds to the school systems and then the school systems use the money that we send them to, you know, fund things in, in according to their own budget and their own um, bu budget priorities. Um, with mental health being such a focus, especially post COVID, um, I would hope that uh, uh, we can see um, more counselors in our schools. But then again, and I, I hate to sound like a broken record, this is another one of those things where, you know, uh, reaching out to your school board um, and letting them know that this is something that you see as a priority um, is really important because. Um, that's how you will, um, that, that's the people who will ultimately make that decision. Thank you. Um, Adunai? Hi, my name is Aduni, I'm 16 years Ooh. old. And um, I was just wondering, how are you making school, sure that school funding is being used properly to make sure schools are more equitable? I know Representative Clark doesn't want to say again, you know, part of it is leaning on the local boards of ed, but but it's important um, to know that we currently, and I know I was a little bit late getting on the call, y'all may have talked about this, but legislature, we basically put the money for the schools into a pot, and then there is a formula from there as to how the money is sent out, and it's a more recent thing, I think it's now, is it three years in a row, so my colleagues might correct me, that we've actually fully funded based on that current formula, our schools. And that's where you talk about the cuts we used to have um, because of the level of money that was coming in, we were not putting as much in that pot as the formula called for, for a long time. And, but one of the questions you look to directly answer your question 
that we ought to look at is we finally are funding using that formula fully funding but is that the right amount is that formula done properly and there was a question earlier when i first jumped on someone asked about making sure basically that we continue to put more money in what else should we be funding was basically the question now that we're fully funding is there not more we should be doing basically i think we're going to learn that and we're going to rely a lot on our friends there in boards of ed um, your local school boards to tell us now that we have we're fully funding under the formula is that enough should we look at it to be done in a different way that's a great question thank you so the next person i have on the list is alicia um okay hi my name is alicia i'm 16 and um this bill was changed quite a while ago, so in 2020, but I think it's still worth talking about. So uh, my question is, why are there so many limitations on House Bill 444, and how can you all ensure that all students throughout Georgia schools get the same opportunities? Alicia, can you say um, what House Bill 444 is about, just to give us some, we, we see a lot of numbers, and so we can't always... <laughs> Yeah, um, it's about dual enrollment and it puts limitations on the funding for dual enrollment. I can tell you, actually, I worked on that bill when it came to the Senate. Um, we first did that bill. That was the first attempt we made at having, going back to the formula, forming the formula question, the last question, that was our first attempt of actually having a set funding formula for dual enrollment. It was something that was set up, I forget how many years ago, maybe before any of us were here, um, but it grew and grew and grew. And every year it was all about, you know, just whatever amount we had to pay for that year in the budget. And there was no really parameters or any limitations put on in any way. And so I can't take the credit for the initial draft when it came to the Senate, I worked on it. But originally there was a panel, I guess if it was 2020, it was in 2019, of educators, um, school board members, superintendents that came together and worked on a draft to try to set forth some parameters on dual enrollment. And I remember even when the bill came to the Senate, I, I would hear some stories from people that were kind of caught in that. And like my my sibling got to do this and I don't get to do this. And it was there was a big adjustment that had to be made to the new formula. Haven't heard as much about it since that first year it was put into effect, but if, if there's anything particular that you see or others see, we could revisit that. We were trying to get it right. We may have got it perfectly right, but we're trying to have it set, to have it set every year in our code moving forward. Um, so we always had it funded at a certain level and could predict that formula every year as we balance our budget. But again, we may have not gotten everything perfect in that. Thank you. The next question is for Zachariah. You mute. You're my mute. name is Zachariah and I'm nine years old. And my second question is, why do we have to wait till the age of 17 years to start voting? Thank you. It's going to Brian, uh, Senator Brian. Brian. Well, it's a great question. I've actually not had, um, I have not been a part of the debate about whether or not we should lower that age, but um, for whatever reason, that's been the age that's been set um, in our law. Is that the right thing? You know, we have to look at at what point um, someone should have a say, right? At what point, I think the, the idea was that was when you become an adult under most of our laws um, in our state, of course, there's the exception earlier, y'all were talking about the raise the age bill. There's an exception there. We're 17 right now makes you an adult with crimes. And so it's an interesting question. I don't know where the right line is, um, but maybe that's something that, that young people like you can help convince policymakers that it should be a different level than it is now. If you can, if you can advocate for lower age, someday might happen. But you know what? You can vote at 18, but you can register in Georgia when you are 17 and a half years old. You can six months ahead. So that's a good news. You can register. <laughs> I would like to pitch in like, you know, the generation now, 17 years was set when it was a few generations back. But nowadays I feel my nine-year-old son 
he's he's already like a teenager now so i think the age the legislators should do something about the change in age that might happen near future never know <laughs> the young people advocate they want it next generation could be 17 who knows yeah, Maybe we will, 16. Learn, we will learn know. more from this generation from the coming generation <laughs> I will not argue with that. I will not argue with that. We are definitely <laughs> learning every day more and more from our young people. And, and there is precedent in other countries where younger people have been allowed to vote, and particularly on, uh, I mean, I think like Brexit or things that were going to have a major impact on the future generation, um, they were invited to vote. So this is not completely impossible, um, but I don't, I don't know that it's going to happen before any of you all turn 17. <laughs> Thank you all. The next question is for Yusuf. I have a question for Representative uh, Clark. Um, my question is, there is always like a, a Christmas tree lighting like every year and Easter eggs on in Lilburn. Can we have like uh, something for Ramadan? So I absolutely love that idea. Um, you know, we have just, uh, so that is at, at a city level. So that's our city council and our mayor. Um, and I believe that if you were to bring that to the city council, I do not think that you would get any objections. I would love to see something like that done. Um, we have um, really, uh, uh, Yunmi Hampton, who just got elected to the city council, she and I have been talking a lot about bringing some type of um, you know, uh, international, like, um, international, uh, I don't want to say fair, I can't think of the word right now, to our area to celebrate the amazing diversity of the Lilburn area. Um, but I would love to see, you know, a, an em embrace of other religions as well in some of the, the programs that we offer in Lilburn. And I believe that, um, you know, um, if, if we want it, we have to ask for it. So I am, um, I am committed to reaching out to the city council and asking for them um, to include things, but I would love to hear more about specific examples of what you would like to see in this celebration um, as um, that is not my religion. So I'm not very um, familiar with all of the specific details of what would make a meaningful program for you. Um, and so this is where I would love for you to reach out to my office. You can send me an email um, and let's talk further about what this would look like and let's bring it to the city council and let's make it happen. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So um, the next person is Oishe, and I'm going to monitor the time to see whether or not we have one more because I want to make sure our legislators have final comments um, before we close out with closing words from the executive director. Go ahead. Yeah, my last question um, was just about, um, I, again, education and Senate Bill um, 226. Um, which is regarding like obscene material not being allowed in school libraries and stuff and how parents can you know just like like lodge a complaint and say you know this shouldn't be in our school libraries i was wondering how do you guys think this will impact our education as i think a lot of reading material that could be considered obscene is actually fundamental to learning um to you know growing and learning, especially as we go into higher education. And I also have a question as to if you guys could elaborate or just tell me what you think like is considered as obscene, as the wording isn't really clear. And I think, I don't know, it's not meant to be clear. I can address that if you want. That bill actually came before the committee that I'm the chairman of last year at least a version of that bill. I'm not sure if that's the exact one. I think it may have been a house bill that did the same thing. And you hit the nail on the head with what is obscene because what's obscene to one person might really be obscene, but the other person doesn't think it is, or it may not be obscene at all, maybe educational. And so what, what I know my committee did, the bill did not pass last year. And again, I'm not sure if it's that bill, but it was one similar. What we did in committee was made the bill to where um, there's no ban on anything, but instead there was a review process that was set up where parents that had complaints 
could take those um, complaints to the Board of Ed and actually discuss that in an open forum. And so we're not just making a blanket ruling on what's obscene and what's not. And, and then the people that are elected locally there can make decisions if something does need to be pulled from an online resource. We know now most of the stuff is online. A lot of us older, even me, that you know, have to remember that's changed since I was in school and now this is all online. And so um, I think that's going to come up again. I know that's the way that that I dealt with the issue because I thought, you know, parents should have a chance to at least have their have, have this heard, but we didn't need to be as legislators trying to define what's obscene. That was my opinion on it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So guys, let me just um, let you know there's 10 minutes. Within this 10 minutes, if you'd give me the liberty, I would like to ask a question to uh, of our participating legislators here today. Mine is simple, and it's something to sort of culminate and close us out before we have closing remarks from our um, executive director, Tower Hall, to each of our participating legislators here today. My simple question is, what is your hope for Georgia's children? You want us to go in any particular order? Yeah. Whoever wants to go first. Like you, I, well, you know what? Let me go down my list. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Jackson. Uh, sure. I, I hope for you all, for Georgia's children, that we can create a Georgia where you all feel safe, where you feel safe to go to school, where you feel safe to come home, where you have enough food to eat where you have an education that prepares you well for whatever it is and wherever it is that you decide to go next. I hope for you all to be able to not just dream big, but to achieve big um, and to come up with new things that we can't even begin to imagine today. And so I'm hoping that we can create a Georgia that will give you the foundation that you need in order to achieve those wild, wild, crazy dreams of yours. Thank you, Senator Jackson. Um, Senator Strickland. I could say amen. I agree with all that, but I'll, I'll add this. Um, I hope that that we leave a, a world to you as people that are older than you, where you will continue to do stuff like this, which is um, have open dialogue, um, discuss things openly. And I know that sounds funny, but I feel like we're getting into a world where you can't disagree with each other without not liking each other, without arguing and fighting with each other. And so I hope that um, as policymakers today, we at least leave a world where um, you feel free to think big, dream big and disagree and compromise with each other um, because you'll have young people ask you the same question one day about the world you're gonna be leaving for them behind. Thanks so much. Senator Rahman. I hope big for Georgia. You know what? We have a saying, we are the number one state in, in for business in Georgia. I want to see Georgia the number one place for our children to grow. That will be the only wish I have. And I want you to look at any, all these young folks, I want you to look at me. I came from Bangladesh, I'm an immigrant. And there was a time I quit school. I was a dropout. I went to University of Georgia after eight years of quitting school and got my degree. You know, I was a dishwasher when I came in, my first job in this country. I'm a Georgia state senator. So you know what? I want you all to look at me and say, hey, if this guy can do it, I can do it too. American dream is still alive and well. So we have a better future. And I really hope we can make Georgia number one state for our children. Thank you so much. Representative Clark. So I'll just say that uh, following the senators, it's really difficult because they have great words. <laughs> um, but what I would say is one of my biggest hopes um, for our children is that, um, that they never um, uh, let that light that they are providing to the world go out. Right now, what we're doing tonight, um, these questions, um, just the thoughts that are going through our youth's minds. Um, all of this is happening and, and, and y'all are the future. 
And so I hope that you all continue to engage with us. I hope that you all continue to think um, as deeply and complex um, and, um, and complex about the issues that are affecting you and your life. And I hope that we, um, as the adults in the room, can agree that in the least, we should be investing in our children. We shouldn't be investing in their education. We should be adding to their curriculum and not taking things away. Um, and that uh, we should be, yeah, we should be enhancing and not removing because at the end of the day, um, these, these children, they're different. You all are different. Um, like I said, y'all have opportunities now that I couldn't even dream about when I was your age. And I think that's going to speak volumes for what you will do for the future. And so I just hope that you all keep going. Keep at it. What you're doing today matters so much. Keep doing it. And Sydney Cleland, would you like to have um, answer that question? You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah. Oh, she loves. <laughs> we thank you for being here. If you can't unmute, but thank you so much. But thank you so much, and and our best regards to Representative Oliver. Um, and I just wanted to um, circle back, and I apologize for everybody. I did not introduce myself. You guys know me with the tons of emails I've sent to each one of you. I'm Priscilla Borders. I'm the Advocacy and Outreach Coordinator for the Interfaith Children's Movement. And thank you so much to each one of you for making this possible and for being patient with all my emails and my communications. Thank you so much. It's the nature of virtual to every single one of your youth, the youth here. I am so proud of you. You guys were phenomenal. You were on point. And remember, your voice matters. And as we train our students in the academy, although you're not old enough to vote, you are each so powerful and influential. So keep it up. And I want to close out with some words from our executive director, Tara Hall. Thank you so much, everyone. To our legislators, thank you so much for investing in our children by showing up today. I'm sorry, are you? <laughs> by showing up today and answering their questions. Young people, thank you so much for your questions. Um, it, you've asked some very thought-provoking questions and, and raised some concerns. And uh, we're so very proud of you for raising your voices today. And I can assure you we'll be following up um, with you and uh, taking um, some invitations from our legislators to reach back out to them with some additional supports for you. But this is what we envisioned for you. We envisioned you being able to have an opportunity to show up um, and raise this awareness um, that your voice matters. And like Priscilla said, you're not old enough to vote, but you do have a voice and your opinion matters. And as the Interfaith Children's Movement, we wanna thank you for, um, for participating. And our goal is, and our, my, what I call my mantra is that there's an old school saying that children should be seen and not heard, but we believe you can be seen and heard. And you did that today. And so um, we thank you for, for raising your voices and, and raising your concerns and, 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 and the issues that are meaningful to you. And again, to our legislators, thank you so much for your participation today. You spoke life into our kids, you encouraged them, you reassured them and we just can't thank you enough. And so again, thank you so much for your time today. And um, we look forward to seeing these young people one day having a seat where you're sitting and also <laughs> becoming presidents and, and so forth and or mayors or council people. This is a platform that's just the beginning for you young people and we're so very proud of you. And so again, thank you everyone for showing up today and uh, blessings and peace and joy to all of you. Have a good night and thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Bye y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, bye. 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 <laughs> bye. Thank you. Bye everyone.